Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the October 2021 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook and discussion of Marxism and Revisionism by Lenin from 1908. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this text is the 14th in the Basic Marxism-Leninism Study Guide, which we've been publishing here on the channel over the last year and a half, along with many side readings and readings on other topics. It's a curriculum presented by an organization called MAI, Movimiento Anti-Imperialista, or Anti-Imperialist Movement. It's a good way to learn the principles of basic Marxism-Leninism, and again, we do many other works here on the channel to branch off of that and to deepen your knowledge. So I'll put a link to that playlist of the basic Marxism-Leninism study guide in the video description, so check for that, as well as a link to the original text, as usual. So, this piece was written not later than April 3rd, 1908. It was published in 1908 in the Symposium Karl Marx, 1818 to 1883, signed V.L. Ilyin, published according to the Symposium. The source is Lenin, Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1973, Moscow, Volume 15. Transcription by Zodiac, HTML markup by Brian Baggins and D. Walters, and it's found online at the Marxists Internet Archive, marxists.org. Thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this file and thousands of other free Marxist texts. Please go check them out. So, let's get into the text. There's a well-known saying that if geometrical axioms affected human interests, attempts would certainly be made to refute them. Theories of natural history, which conflicted with the old prejudices of theology, provoked, and still provoke, the most rabid opposition. Comment, still a hundred years later, the same thing. No wonder, therefore, that the Marxian doctrine, which directly serves to enlighten and organize the advanced class in modern society, indicates the tasks facing this class and demonstrates the inevitable replacement, by virtue of economic development, of the present system by a new order. No wonder that this doctrine has had to fight for every step forward in the course of its life. Needless to say, this applies to bourgeois science and philosophy, officially taught by official professors, in order to befuddle the rising generation of the propertied classes, and to coach it against internal and foreign enemies. This science will not even hear of Marxism, declaring that it has been refuted and annihilated. Commenting again, <laughs> Lenin was writing a hundred years ago, and, you know, this never ended. The things you hear today, Marxism's dead, communism's dead. They were saying this back in Lenin's time, <laughs> before the USSR was even founded. So, take that for what it's worth when you hear it. Marx is attacked with equal zest by young scholars who are making a career by refuting socialism, and by decrepit elders who are preserving the tradition of all kinds of outworn systems. The progress of Marxism, the fact that its ideas are spreading and taking firm hold among the working class, inevitably increase the frequency and intensity of these bourgeois attacks on Marxism, which becomes stronger, more hardened, and more vigorous every time it is, quote, annihilated by official science. But even among doctrines connected with the struggle of the working class, and current mainly among the proletariat, Marxism by no means consolidated its position all at once. In the first half century of its existence, from the 1840s on, Marxism was engaged in combating theories fundamentally hostile to it. In the early 1840s, Marx and Engels settled accounts with the radical young Hegelians, whose viewpoint was that of philosophical idealism. At the end of the 40s, the struggle began in the field of economic doctrine, against Proudhonism. The 50s saw the completion of this struggle in criticism of the parties and doctrines which manifested themselves in the stormy year of 1848. In the 60s, the struggle shifted from the field of general theory to one closer to the direct labor movement, the ejection of Bakuninism from the international. In the early 70s, the stage in Germany was occupied for a short while by the Proudhonist Mühlberger, and in the late 70s by the positivist During. But the influence of both on the proletariat 
was already absolutely insignificant. Marxism was already gaining an unquestionable victory over all other ideologies in the labor movement. By the 1890s, this victory was in the main completed. Even in the Latin countries, where the traditions of Proudhonism held their ground longest of all, the workers' parties, in effect, built their programs and their tactics on Marxist foundations. They revived international organization of the labor movement in the shape of periodical international congresses, from the outset, and almost without a struggle, adopted the Marxist standpoint in all essentials. But after Marxism had ousted all the more or less integral doctrines hostile to it, the tendencies expressed in those doctrines began to seek other channels. The forms and causes of the struggle changed, but the struggle continued. And the second half-century of the existence of Marxism began, in the 90s, with the struggle of a trend hostile to Marxism within Marxism itself. Bernstein, a one-time orthodox Marxist, gave his name to this trend by coming forward with the most noise and with the most purposeful expression of amendments to Marx, revision of Marx, revisionism. Even in Russia where, owing to the economic backwardness of the country and the preponderance of a peasant population weighed down by the relics of serfdom, non-Marxist socialism has naturally held its ground longest of all. It is plainly passing into revisionism before our very eyes, both in the agrarian question, the program of the municipalization of all land, and in general questions of program and tactics, our social narodniks are more and more substituting amendments to Marx for the moribund and obsolete remnants of their old system, which, in its own way, was integral and fundamentally hostile to Marxism. Pre-Marxist socialism has been defeated. It is continuing the struggle, no longer on its own independent ground, but on the general ground of Marxism as revisionism. So just to comment there, that's a really key point. So even by this time, uh, I mean, what Marx and Engels set out to do, they basically went through all the utopian and idealist philosophies of progressive social change, which existed up to the 1840s. And they ruthlessly criticized them, and they subjected them to really rigorous analysis. And the result, what they felt would actually work in the end and was the strongest ideas which could hold up to all that analysis, they called scientific socialism, what we call Marxism today. So when Lenin says pre-Marxist socialism, it's all the stuff before Marx and Engels got their hands on it. So what he's saying here is that Pre-Marxist socialism, although it's been defeated and it's just sort of like lingering on in the more backwards areas, it's still continuing the struggle, but no longer on its own independent ground because its name, what you know, whatever the various different forms of these obsolete kinds of socialism were, they're now reappearing as, quote, Marxism. And Lenin is calling this revisionism because it's not Marxism <laughs> These are ideas that Marx and Engels rigorously criticized and, you know, they, if there was anything of value, they kept it. Otherwise, they threw it out. But so these old bad ideas are popping back up again, calling themselves Marxist, but this is revisionism. So, continuing, let us then examine the ideological content of revisionism. In the sphere of philosophy, revisionism followed in the wake of bourgeois professorial, quote, science. The professors went back to Kant, and revisionism dragged along after the Neo-Kantians. The professors repeated the platitudes that priests have uttered a thousand times against philosophical materialism, and the revisionists, smiling indulgently, mumbled, word for word after the latest handbook, that materialism had been refuted, quote-unquote, long ago. The professors treated Hegel as a dead dog, and while themselves preaching idealism, only an idealism a thousand times more petty and banal than Hegel's, contemptuously shrugged their shoulders at dialectics, and the revisionists floundered after them into the swamp of philosophical vulgarization of science, replacing, quote, artful and revolutionary dialectics by, quote, simple and tranquil, quote, evolution. The professors earned their official salaries by adjusting both their idealist and their, quote, critical systems 
to the dominant medieval philosophy, i.e. theology, and the revisionists drew close to them, trying to make religion a, quote, private affair, not in relation to the modern state, but in relation to the party of the advanced class. What such, quote, amendments to Marx really meant in class terms need not be stated. It is self-evident. We shall simply note that the only Marxist in the international social democratic movement to criticize the incredible platitudes of the revisionists from the standpoint of consistent dialectical materialism was Plekhanov. This must be stressed all the more emphatically, since profoundly mistaken attempts are being made at the present time to smuggle in old and reactionary philosophical rubbish disguised as a criticism of Plekhanov's tactical opportunism. There's a footnote there. See Studies in the Philosophy of Marxism by Bogdanov, Bazarov, and others. This is not the place to discuss the book, and I must at present confine myself to stating that in the very near future, I shall prove in a series of articles or in a separate pamphlet that everything I have said in the text about Neo-Kantian revisionists essentially applies also to these, quote, new neo-humist and neo-Berkeleyan revisionists. Passing to political economy, it must be noted, first of all, that in this sphere, the amendments of the revisionists were much more comprehensive and circumstantial. Attempts were made to influence the public by, quote, new data on economic development. It was said that concentration and the ousting of small-scale production by large-scale production do not occur in agriculture at all, while they proceed very slowly in commerce and industry. It was said that crises had now become rarer and weaker, and that cartels and trusts would probably enable capital to eliminate them altogether. It was said that the, quote, theory of collapse to which capitalism is heading was unsound, owing to the tendency of class antagonisms to become milder and less acute. 2008. It was said, finally, that it would not be amiss to correct Marx's theory of value, too, in accordance with Bohm Bavarck, footnote, an Austrian bourgeois economist. The fight against the revisionists on these questions resulted in as fruitful a revival of the theoretical thought in international socialism, as did Engels' controversy with During 20 years earlier. The arguments of the revisionists were analyzed with the help of facts and figures. It was proved that the revisionists were systematically painting a rose-colored picture of modern small-scale production. The technical and commercial superiority of large-scale production over small-scale production, not only in industry, but also in agriculture, is proved by irrefutable facts. But commodity production is far less developed in agriculture, and modern statisticians and economists are, as a rule, not very skillful in picking out the special branches, sometimes even the operations, in agriculture, which indicate that agriculture is being progressively drawn into the process of exchange in world economy. Small-scale production maintains itself on the ruins of natural economy by constant worsening of diet, by chronic starvation, by lengthening of the working day, by deterioration in the quality and the care of cattle, in a word, by the very methods whereby handicraft production maintained itself against capitalist manufacture. Every advance in science and technology inevitably and relentlessly undermines the foundations of small-scale production in capitalist society, and it is the task of socialist political economy to investigate this process in all its forms, often complicated and intricate, and to demonstrate to the small producer the impossibility of his holding his own under capitalism, the hopelessness of peasant farming under capitalism, and the necessity for the peasant to adopt the standpoint of the proletarian. On this question, the revisionists sinned, in the scientific sense, by superficial generalizations based on facts selected one-sidedly and without reference to the system of capitalism as a whole. From the political point of view, they sinned by the fact that they inevitably, whether they wanted to or not, invited or urged the peasant to adopt the attitude of a small proprietor, i.e. the attitude of the bourgeoisie, instead of urging him to adopt the point of view of the revolutionary proletarian. The position of revisionism was even worse as regards the theory of crises and the theory of collapse. Only for a very short time could people, and then only the most short-sighted, 
think of refashioning the foundations of Marx's theory under the influence of a few years of industrial boom and prosperity. Realities very soon made it clear to the revisionists that crises were not a thing of the past. Prosperity was followed by a crisis. The forms, the sequence, the picture of particular crises changed, but crises remained an inevitable component of the capitalist system. While uniting production, the cartels, and trusts at the same time, and in a way that was obvious to all, aggravated the anarchy of production, the insecurity of existence of the proletariat, and the oppression of capital, thereby intensifying class antagonisms to an unprecedented degree. That capitalism is heading for a breakdown, in the sense both of individual political and economic crises, and of the complete collapse of the entire capitalist system, has been made particularly clear, and on a particularly large scale, precisely by the new giant trusts. The recent financial crisis in America, and the appalling increase of unemployment all over Europe, to say nothing of the impending industrial crisis to which many symptoms are pointing, all this has resulted in the recent theories of the revisionists having been forgotten by everybody, including, apparently, many of the revisionists themselves. But the lessons which this instability of the intellectuals had given the working class must not be forgotten. As to the theory of value, it need only be said that apart from the vaguest of hints and sighs, a la Bohm Bavark, the revisionists have contributed absolutely nothing, and have therefore left no traces whatsoever on the development of scientific thought. In the sphere of politics, revisionism did really try to revise the foundation of Marxism, namely the doctrine of the class struggle. Political freedom, democracy, and universal suffrage remove the ground for the class struggle, we were told, and render untrue the old proposition of the Communist Manifesto that the working men have no country. For, they said, since the, quote, will of the majority prevails in a democracy, one must neither regard the state as an organ of class rule, nor reject alliances with the progressive social reform bourgeoisie against the reactionaries. It cannot be disputed that these arguments of the revisionists amounted to a fairly well-balanced system of views, namely the old and well-known liberal bourgeois views. The liberals have always said that bourgeois parliamentarism destroys classes and class divisions. Since the right to vote and the right to participate in the government of the country are shared by all citizens without distinction. The whole history of Europe in the second half of the 19th century and the whole history of the Russian Revolution in the early 20th clearly show how absurd such views are. Economic distinctions are not mitigated but aggravated and intensified under the freedom of, quote, democratic capitalism. Parliamentarism does not eliminate but lays bare the innate character even of the most democratic bourgeois republics as organs of class oppression. By helping to enlighten and to organize immeasurably wider masses of the population than those which previously took an active part in political events, parliamentarism does not make for the elimination of crises and political revolutions, but for the maximum intensification of civil war during such revolutions. The events in Paris in the spring of 1871 and the events in Russia in the winter of 1905 showed as clearly as could be how inevitably this intensification comes about. The French bourgeoisie, without a moment's hesitation, made a deal with the enemy of the whole nation, with the foreign army which had ruined its country, in order to crush the proletarian movement. Whoever does not understand the inevitable inner dialectics of parliamentarism and bourgeois democracy which leads to an even sharper decision of the argument by mass violence than formerly, will never be able on the basis of this parliamentarism to conduct propaganda and agitation consistent in principle, really preparing the working class masses for victorious participation in such, quote, arguments. The experience of alliances, agreements, and blocks with the social reform liberals in the West and with the liberal reformists, cadets, in the Russian Revolution, has convincingly shown that these agreements only blunt the consciousness of the masses, that they do not enhance but weaken the actual significance of their struggle by linking fighters with elements who are least capable of fighting and most vacillating and treacherous. Millerandism in France, the biggest experiment in applying revisionist political tactics on a wide 
a really national scale, has provided a practical appraisal of revisionism that will never be forgotten by the proletariat all over the world. A natural complement to the economic and political tendencies of revisionism was its attitude to the ultimate aim of the socialist movement. Quote, the movement is everything, the ultimate aim is nothing. This catchphrase of Bernstein's expresses the substance of revisionism better than many long disquisitions. To determine its conduct from case to case, to adapt itself to the events of the day, and to the chopping and changing of petty politics, to forget the primary interests of the proletariat, and the basic features of the whole capitalist system, all of capitalist evolution, to sacrifice these primary interests for the real or assumed advantages of the moment, such is the policy of revisionism. And it patently follows from the very nature of this policy, that it may assume an infinite variety of forms, and that every more or less, quote, new question, every more or less unexpected and unforeseen turn of events, even though it changes the basic line of development only to an insignificant degree and only for the briefest period, will always inevitably give rise to one variety of revisionism or another. The inevitability of revisionism is determined by its class roots in modern society. Revisionism is an international phenomenon. No thinking socialist who is in the least informed can have the slightest doubt that the relationship between the Orthodox and the Bernsteinians in Germany the Gesdists and the Jarzists, and now particularly the Brucists in France, the Social Democratic Federation and the Independent Labour Party in Great Britain, Brucaire and Vandervelde in Belgium, the Integralists and the Reformists in Italy, the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks in Russia, is everywhere essentially similar, notwithstanding the immense variety of national conditions and historical factors in the present state of all these countries. In reality, the, quote, division within the present international socialist movement is now proceeding along the same lines in all the various countries of the world, which testifies to a tremendous advance compared with 30 or 40 years ago when heterogeneous trends in the various countries were struggling within the one international socialist movement. And that, quote, revisionism from the left which has taken shape in the Latin countries as, quote, revolutionary syndicalism. And there's a footnote there. Revolutionary syndicalism is a petty bourgeois semi-anarchist trend that made its appearance in the labor movement of a number of West European countries at the close of the 19th century. The syndicalists saw no need for the working class to engage in political struggle. They repudiated the leading role of the party and the dictatorship of the proletariat. They believed that by organizing a general strike of the workers in the trade unions, in France, syndicat, could, without a revolution, overthrow capitalism and take control over production. So, so in the Latin countries, revolutionary syndicalism is also adapting itself to Marxism, quote, amending it. La Briola in Italy and Lagardelle in France frequently appeal from Marx who is understood wrongly to Marx who is understood rightly. We cannot stop here to analyze the ideological content of this revisionism, which as yet is far from having developed to the same extent as opportunist revisionism. It has not yet become international, has not yet stood the test of a single big practical battle with the Socialist Party in any single country. We confine ourselves, therefore, to that revisionism from the right, which was described above. Wherein lies its inevitability? In capitalist society? Why is it more profound than the differences of national peculiarities and of degrees of capitalist development? Because in every capitalist country, side by side with the proletariat, there are always broad strata of the petty bourgeoisie, small proprietors. Capitalism arose and is constantly arising out of small production. A number of new middle strata are inevitably brought into existence again and again by capitalism. Appendages to the factory, work at home, small workshops scattered all over the country to meet the requirements of big industries such as the bicycle and automobile industries, etc. These new small producers are just as inevitably being cast again into the ranks of the proletariat. It is quite natural that the petty bourgeois world outlook should, again and again, crop up in the ranks of the broad workers' parties. It is quite natural that this should be so, and always will be so, right up to the changes of fortune that will take place in the proletarian revolution. 
for it would be a profound mistake to think that the, quote, complete proletarianization of the majority of the population is essential for bringing about such a revolution. So a comment there. In other words, what Lenin is saying is there may never be complete proletarianization because there are always small producers starting up this little cottage industry or that, and then maybe that gets bought by some bigger bourgeois interest and then folded into large-scale production, etc. But uh, basically, there's a big difference between when capitalism started, you know, and only 10% of the population or 20% were proletarians. And then as capitalism progressed, you got up to 80 or 90 percent are proletarians. That's the overall balance that we want to look at, whether 100 percent, you know, the difference between 99 percent and 100 percent, that's uh, not really as significant as, you know, 30, 40 percent up to 70, 80 percent. What you're looking at is a population that is, you know, overwhelmingly proletarian. Okay. What we now frequently experience only in the domain of ideology, namely disputes over theoretical amendments to Marx, what now crops up in practice only over individual side issues of the labor movement, as tactical differences with the revisionists and splits on this basis, is bound to be experienced by the working class on an incomparably larger scale when the proletarian revolution will sharpen all disputed issues will focus all differences on points which are of the most immediate importance in determining the conduct of the masses, and will make it necessary, in the heat of the fight, to distinguish enemies from friends and to cast out bad allies in order to deal decisive blows to the enemy. The ideological struggle waged by revolutionary Marxism against revisionism at the end of the 19th century is but the prelude to the great revolutionary battles of the proletariat, which is marching forward to the complete victory of its cause, despite all the waverings and weaknesses of the petty bourgeoisie. So that's the end of the audiobook, and I'm going to leave it there. What do you think? Leave a comment. We'll continue the discussion in the comment section below. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash Socialism for All. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful, so thanks for that. If you'd like to help out without a donation, liking, subscribing, clicking the notifications bell, leaving a comment, and sharing these videos in your social media all help to expand the audience, broaden the conversation. Ultimately, whatever it is you do for the cause of socialism in your community and online, thanks for doing it. Join an organization if there's a good one in your area and we will catch you in the next video.